Welcome to Forbidden Planet TV uh, and uh, welcome to a very special two-part edition of Forbidden Planet TV where we're joined by um, Lainey Taylor, the author of Daughter of Smoke and Bone, the trilogy and The Strange, the Dreamer, duology and Samantha Shannon, the author of the, the Bone Season series and the, the one-off novel, the excellent one-off novel, the Priory, of the, Orin the Priory of the Orange Tree. Good to see you both. Thanks so much for joining us. Thanks for having us. Mm -hmm. And last but not least, we are joined by Forbidden Planet's <laughs> mighty book buyer, Laura Dodd. Thank you very much. <laughs> so, as I said at the top, this is the first of uh, two interview sessions. Over to you, Laura. Okay, yes, yeah. So, um, let's, let's start with um, Lainey's questions. Um, and then we'll obviously have some for Samantha and, and you can kind of um, say whatever comes to mind. So, um, this is going to be super fun. Um, so you started writing as a um, teenager, is that correct? But obviously a, kind of a, a later on in your first 30s actually started getting kind of uh, published. Um, do you still have some of your teenage writings? And if so, is there any works of note? <laughs> <laughs> um, it's funny, yeah. I, so I, I have wanted to be a writer all my life, but I didn't really kick it into gear until my 30s. Um, so I have always had a lot of envy for you, Samantha. I'm like, how did you do it? And when you first when you first started getting published, I was like, she's how old? <laughs> yeah, but no, fun. I'm in I'm in awe. Truly, I am. Um, I had a lot of I had difficulty getting going, but um, but I do have. I used to write. Um, a, a story or a book for my best friend for her birthday every year in high school and they were really elaborate and there was a choose your own adventure book and there was this one that was a gothic horror and um it was set it was it was it's it's ludicrous but it's also really fun and I can see some some of my my early tendencies like but completely overwritten like the metaphors are so so over the top <laughs> There's a, there's a sentence where um, there's curtains blowing out of the windows of an abandoned mansion. And it was, um, <laughs> I had written that they were like something like, uh, it was something like that they were trying to escape like doves pinned to God's lapels. <laughs> Um, when I found it a few years ago, Jim drew me a cartoon of, of God going like, get them off me. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God, that's amazing. Um, but it's funny, uh, like looking at it now, this was like back in the, the late 1980s. And um, it was such a precursor to what would become Supernatural YA. But I was writing it as a joke because I was a really snobby kid, like teenager. I only read literature and I completely missed like, you know, the opportunity to write what I actually loved when I was at that age. And so I wrote this one piece as a joke and I'm like, actually, like I was onto something, but I didn't know it. So, <laughs> but yeah, oh my God. don't uh, pin, don't pin doves to God. <laughs> <laughs> I want that on a t-shirt. No one will know what it means, but I want it on a t-shirt anyway. Take it, means, uh, take it easy on your metaphors, Lainey. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. And on, on kind of a, a similar vein, I know, um, Samantha, you had kind of a, a, a sci-fi book you were working on many years ago. Um, what, what ever happened to that? Um, it was consigned to the universal trash bin where it belongs. Um, <laughs> no, I'm kidding. And so basically, um, Aurora was a novel I wrote sort of between the ages of 15 and 18. And it was kind of like a precursor to the bone season. So I developed... Um, some of my early ideas for the magic system in there, like the dreamscape. Um, but it was not, it was not my best piece of work. Um, something that's particularly interesting about it is I developed um, the character of Warden, who's the sort of deuteragonist, arguably, of the Bone Season series. Um, and there was a character called Warden in Aurora, but he was um, like the embodiment of toxic masculinity in Aurora, because apparently when I was a teenager, that's what I thought was uh, was what you should want in a in a potential love interest. And it's, it's quite weird looking back on my diaries at that time, because I had obviously absorbed um, something that made me think that, you know, men being very aggressive and dominant and jealous was very attractive. Um, so I when I wrote The Bone Season, I thought the idea for his character, like his kind of history and, you know, things like that were really interesting. But I basically built him to be the opposite of his Aurora self. So I just completely deconstructed the character and rebuilt him into 
yeah basically the opposite of uh, aurora warden but yeah it's so i tried to get it published fortunately it wasn't published because that would have been really bad <laughs> so um so laney before um the amazing daughter of smoke and bone trilogy you had two novels in a series called the dream dark that came out with penguin in the us i believe have you always had a fascination with dreams <laughs> no it's funny they they do keep coming back i even wrote uh a short story for an anthology called The Girl Who Woke the Dreamer. So it's definitely, I mean, I guess I have. I don't, I'm not a vivid dreamer myself. I don't often remember my dreams, but um, I love the the way that dreams work on multiple levels. Um, and yeah, there's just, it's, you know, in fantasy, it's a very rich place to explore. But it's funny because I've never loved <laughs> dream sequences in, in books or, or movies or TV shows when it starts. It's kind of like that um and so then I was writing Strange the Dreamer and it suddenly occurred to me that I'd set myself up to write a book full of dream sequences <laughs> I was like oh no yeah but uh but they aren't really I realize they're not really dream sequences they're just um they're just encounters that take place in an environment that the that they can manipulate so it was it was not like the unconscious was in control so it was okay <laughs> Um, do you do you find that you dream yourself as well? Like, do you wake up and can you remember dreams or? No, not so much. Like, if I change my schedule and set an alarm early, like I might wake myself up in the middle of the dream. For the most part, I don't remember them very often, and it's a big bummer. I wish that I did, um, hmm, but I don't know. How about you guys? Are you are you vivid dreamers? Um, I. It's only normally if I haven't had a lot of sleep, and then you suddenly manage to get a couple of hours. So you're, it's almost like lucid dreams. And then you'll just wake up and be like, I dreamt of a chocobo or it'd just be something really random. <laughs> <laughs> it's not helpful to writing or my career in any way. <laughs> Though, you know, chocobos. Um, but how, how about you, uh, Samantha? You obviously have uh, the idea of dreams in your series as well, with obviously Paige being a dream walker. Yes, um, I've, I've always been fascinated by dreaming and, and similarly, I'm not a particularly vivid dreamer. I have repeated anxiety dreams about not having studied for an exam that I took 10 years ago, um, which is slightly annoying. Um, but yeah, I, I am really interested in them. I remember when I was a teenager, I really wanted to learn how to lucid dream and I never managed it, but I, it was just my fixation for ages. I was like learning how to take control of your dreams and I guess that's sort of where Paige's gift came from. It was like a manifestation of that desire to actually be able to walk and control, you know, your dream self. Which exam do you dream that you're in? This is what happens when you're uh, in the gifted and talented class at school. Um, so I, it's always my GCSE maths exam because ah. I'm, I'm haunted by the fact that in my GCSEs, I got all A stars apart from maths, which I got an A. And I guess that still really haunts me. <laughs> There you go. <laughs> I know I still think about it now like but yeah it's, it's this weird dream where like I always think that I haven't um I, you know I'm trying to find the classroom because I haven't done any studying and the exam is in like three days and it's just it's just haunting I can't believe I'm still dreaming about it like 10 years after my GCSE it's ridiculous it's funny, my recurring anxiety dream isn't school it's um when I used to work as a waitress in the service industry oh, you've heard yeah. about this but anyone who's worked in a race at, in a restaurant will be haunted by this you know you have too many customers and you can't keep up dreams and even like decades later now I still I'll still have them sometimes and they're awful yeah customer yeah. service and anything like that is so so stressful I, I think it's a very powerful and universal human thing isn't it because uh, I know that my recurring dreams uh, can join some of the things you've been talking about I always dream about being in a school play so it's at school but not being able to remember the words. That happens all the time. And uh, the other thing I suffer from a lot is uh, night terrors. So my, oh, really? my, oh, my, adult, wow. my adult kids who, who live with me frequently wake me up at four in the morning while I'm screaming. Oh. <laughs> God. Yeah, and that happens all the time. And, and as Laura will attest, I'm a relatively jolly person. Yeah, so, you know, it, it's, it's, I don't know what's going on. And I never remember them. I just remember. I was going to ask if you remembered what you were dreaming. I, 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 <laughs> but I, I wake up with a sense of all consuming dread and it takes me about 10 minutes to snap out of it. You know, so sort of almost. Like, what's going on in the brain? You know, what's, you know it's so, yeah. it's so interesting. To so interesting. Yeah, yeah. Lovecraftian horror in my case, I think. <laughs> 
And on that note, I'm going to ask you about <laughs> something more positive, which is something Laura and I were talking about uh, b- b- before this was uh, how beautiful the uh, the new jackets are Ooh. for the uh, Daughter of Smoke and Bone tr- uh, trilogy. We we were really taken with them. Um, how much input do you get into the formulation of those? They're really good. Cool. Yeah. Um, well, Hotter and Sutton, my my publisher, does amazing covers, and um, I've just been so lucky from the beginning with them. They've done these incredible covers, and I love that that they will always change from hardcover to paperback, which isn't something in the states that they necessarily do. Usually, in the states, yes. if they change the cover, it's an indication that they want to catch a different market or something. Whereas in that Hotter just does it as a matter of course. And I love, like, I always want a new cover, you know? Um, it's just more covers. <laughs> um, and so, but they've always been, you know, they're not a fantasy publisher. Um, and the covers have always been very elegant, mainstream, you know, uh, could kind of, you know, you don't necessarily know that it's fantasy. And so for this one, since it's a re-release, and since I thought, why don't we just court the fantasy audience? Like, why don't we just not be bashful about it? And so um, so they agreed to do character covers and to go in a more fantasy direction. And, you know, and they still kept their their really, you know, elegant, hotter aesthetic. And I think it's incredible. Mm-hmm. And they do all, you know, they, they do so much work finding the right illustrator. And and by the time I see anything, it's it's very far along in the process. Um, and they, they do want feedback, but it was mostly, um, you know, little things. And they're just so good. They're just so good at it. They're, they're really beautiful. You, of course, wrote the uh, the image graphic novel, The Drown, didn't you? Like, And didn't your husband illustrate it? Yeah, so that was our first book. It was uh, 2004, I think. And um, so usually I cite my first book as being Blackbringer, but that's my favorite, my first novel. My first book was a comic and it was a, a graphic novel from Image. And we we went down to San Diego Comic-Con and got a little booth and sat there. And it was, uh, it was just... Um, it was a it was an experience um but uh jim we still love it and jim would love to do a sequel but i don't really have any ideas <laughs> in regards to kind of the, your inspirations for um the series so the sketchbook in particular um like the serpent woman and the the wishmonger and everything um have you always had a fascination with like monsters of myth and legend is this where that kind of comes from yeah, I have. I've always loved mythology and reading mythology. And, uh, you know, I hadn't really, I, I mean, the only books that I have in my office are mythology, folk tales, um, folklore, fairy tales. Um, but I think in the last, for, for very many years, I, I don't necessarily, I haven't really read them as much as I used to. It's just all sort of in there. Occasionally I'll flip through, but, um, but it's not, that I'm taking any specific tradition. It's just, I think that there's very few imaginative training grounds as good as the, sort of like the history of the human imagination, you know, <laughs> uh, which is what I think that, that mythology is. And um, it's pretty cool. My 11 year old has recently gotten super hooked on mythology and, it, um, and it's, been really, it's been really fun uh, watching that. And she's, you know, she's taking some Zoom classes through her weird schooling year on uh, mythology. <laughs> and she's really into Egyptian mythology, especially. Um, so yeah, so that's been cool. Would you ever consider um, putting your works kind of into another medium? Yes, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's a yeah. big yes. <laughs> yeah, I mean, actually, something that I mean, we're trying. I would really like to see the Bone Season as a TV show, and um, that's something that I would absolutely adore. I think it would be really cool. But I'd also really like to see it as a video game. I've become kind of obsessed with this idea recently because I don't. The thing is, I don't know how to get a book made into a video game or even where to start. Like, because obviously with TV and film, you tend to get people approaching your agent um, and asking for the rights. But I don't know how something like The Witcher happened, but I'm bec- I've become completely obsessed with this now. Like, I just think it would make a really good, like, RPG. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the thing with games is that they're so expensive to produce and they yeah. require so many people. And it's, But yeah, it's absolutely, it's like the holy grail now to get a, to have a game. It would be amazing. Um, I don't also, if anyone's listening, uh, we both are interested. (laughs) I would also love to have, um, more graphic novel adaptations and, um, and also TV show would be great. Yes. Yeah. The settings of, um, the world. Have you ever had the opportunity to visit Prague or is that something you're going to do when we're all allowed to travel again? (laughs) Yeah. So, um, 
the first time I went to Prague was back in the 90s and it was had just opened up um, and it was very different from from now there was like you didn't find signs in any other language but Czech and, and you know um, it was it was just you know, I, you never knew what you were eating because the menus were in check and they weren't the same things that were on your, and it was cool. It was like really cool to be able to have that experience because then Jim and I went back in 2004 after The Drowned would have been published. We were planning our next graphic novel, which we ended up not doing, but um, it was a vampire story. And we thought um, that wouldn't it be cool to set it in Prague? So we went to Prague for nine days in, in 2004 or five and just sort of like stalked the city, figuring out where the vampires lived and um, taking pictures for photo reference. And it was really cool looking at it from that angle. And then we ended up not doing that book, but um, but then years later when I was, um, when I come up with the idea for Daughter of Smoke and Bone um, and I was like, where should it be set? And I kind of tried out a few different settings and then, but really Prague was just sitting in my mind from having, you know, visited it as a setting. Um, and it was just so perfect, you know, cause for me, it's this, you know, well, First of all, as an American, all European cities are very much more fairy tale than what we get in our in our day to day life. But there's something about Prague that's like more fairy tale and more gothic and dark and mysterious. That you have a place that feels like it's pulled out of a story, but that it's real and that you know people are going to school there and doing all their normal things. And um, but it has this this weird deep history of magic and the occult and alchemy and all this cool stuff. So. Um, so yes, yeah, so I had been there and I had not yet been to Morocco, but I sort of got a little bit obsessed with Morocco while I was writing the book. Uh, I think just some blogs that I came across at the time. So I was reading a lot and watching YouTube videos. And then after I finished the book before it was copy edited, I did get to go to Morocco. So I could have made changes um, and I might've made some, but then really Days of Blood and Starlight, I'm sure would have been a completely different book if we hadn't taken that trip because we went down into the desert and um, toured the Cosbas and that was why that setting um, came about. Wow. Yeah. So that's amazing. I really want to read that uh, Vampires of Prague graphic novel. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's funny because I just found out that Jay Kristoff um, wrote Empire of the Vampire partly in Prague. And I was like, oh my God. I was like, oh my gosh. Yeah. But it's not set in Prague. He just went, he's like, I think I'm going to go to Prague to write this book because why not? <laughs> it's a lot of Jay Rolls. <laughs> that is fantastic. Yeah. And that you that has brought us to the end of part one of this dual interview. And uh, you have been watching Forbidden Planet TV, where we have had the pleasure of speaking to Samantha Shannon and Lainey Taylor and the invincible Laura Dodd. And if you're watching this in real time, we'll be back tomorrow night with part two. And all the books that we've been discussing in this interview, you can buy from the links attached to this interview right now. Take care, everybody. Thanks, guys. Bye bye. If you're enjoying watching Forbidden Planet TV and you're enjoying watching us talk to the world's most interesting and accomplished filmmakers, authors, artists, musicians, creators, subscribe right here. See you soon.